presso la Scuola di Relazioni Internazionali dell'Università della Georgia negli Stati Uniti ed è anche docente presso il Centro di Ricerca sull'Estremismo dell'Università di Oslo. È autore di numerosi libri, fra i quali vorrei citare Populismo, una breve introduzione, che è edito da Oxford University Press. È apparso nel 2017 e credo che eh, rimanga una lettura fondamentale per chi vuole capire meglio eh, questo fenomeno. Lo potete scaricare anche facilmente su Kindle in inglese. Ehm, nel suo account su Twitter, Cass dice di avere una missione quella di spiegare che quando parliamo di populismo parliamo in realtà di estrema destra. Un'altra cosa interessante è che come sfondo sul suo account di Twitter eh, cassa l'immagine di Bart Simpson, uno dei ragazzi della famiglia Simpson, che in un apparente castigo alla lavagna scrive decine di volte «The Trump vote was not a populist vote». Il voto per Trump non è stato un voto populista. Direi che basta questa opinione un po' contrastante con la maggior parte delle analisi del voto americano per farci venire voglia di sentire di più eh, da, dal nostro speaker. Cass è anche editorialista per il giornale inglese The Guardian e in un commento che ha pubblicato soltanto qualche giorno fa dopo eh, il voto europeo invitava i liberali europei a non festeggiare troppo queste elezioni e offrire invece una visione liberal-democratica coerente e convincente. Aggiungeva che però che su questo fronte queste elezioni non offrivano buone notizie. Quindi eh, immagino che anche voi come me siate molto curiosi di sentire di più eh, da Cass, per tutte le curiosità che vi rimarranno dopo la sua eh, presentazione, ci sarà spazio per le domande, e intanto lascio la parola a Cass. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for that lovely introduction, and a shout out to my Twitter, where according to my wife, I spend way too much time. Um, what I'm going to do today is, in about 35-40 minutes, I will pretty much summarize that little booklet called Populism, a very short introduction, by looking at kind of what populism is, who populists are, um, what the consequences are, uh, what the causes are of their success, and what the consequences are of their success. And in the end, in the conclusion, I will indeed make that point that I make um, on Twitter as well, which is that I think it is time to move away from using populism just by itself and start to talk more about the far right. So, without further ado, the definition, which is, in the end, what it's all about. And um, it's very customary to, to, by and large, say, well, no one knows what populism means, everyone is disagreeing about it, etc., etc. To a certain extent, that's true. But that's true for virtually every major concept in politics. Democracy, freedom, socialism, fascism, all of those have very different definitions. About 20, 30 years ago, populism was truly defined in all kinds of different ways. An economic platform, uh, a social movement, an ideology. Today, I think that the vast majority of authors within, uh, I would say, broader the social sciences, irrespective of what region, work with what we call the ideational approach in which populism is first and foremost seen as a set of ideas. Now, I personally consider it a thin-centered ideology. I will say more about that later. Um, other people see it as a style or as a discourse, but the differences for the rest of it are not that big. And so I define populism as a thin-centered ideology that considers society to be ultimately separated into two homogenous and antagonistic groups, the pure people and the corrupt elite, and which argues that politics should be an expression of the volonté générale, or the general will of the people. There are three elements in that definition that are important to note. The first is 
ideology, particularly fin-centered. I see it as an ideology because I believe that populism is not just a strategy to win power. And once populists are in power, this vision informs not just how they justify actions, but what actions they take. Second of all, populism is a monist ideology in the sense that they don't consider society to really um, consist of different groups with different values and, and different interests. For them, society really is only the people. And all members of the people have exactly the same interests and exactly the same values. There's only one group that they, that they accept or that they recognize as being part of that same space, and that's the elite. But the elite, all are corrupt. And because they are corrupt, they do not deserve the same protections as the people. And that comes to the last part, which is moralism. The distinction between the people and the elite is not about class, as it is in Marxism. It's not about money. It's not even whether or not you're in the government. It is about values. Whether you have the values <clears throat> that are pure, or whether you have values that are corrupt. And this explains why you have so many very rich people who can sell themselves as the voice of the people. Because it is not about whether they have money or were even born into money. It is about whether or not they stand with the values of the people. And so people like Silvio Berlusconi or Donald Trump obviously do not live as the common Italian or the common American in the sense of having, I don't know how many different houses and I mean, golden elevators as Trump has. But Trump eats at McDonald's. Trump put ketchup on a steak. Trump doesn't go to the opera. Right? And so he is with the people in that and that is the reason. Now, the consequence of having primarily a moralist distinction rather than an interest distinction is polarization, and I will talk about that more. But if you have a Marxist distinction between the people and capital, the worker and capital, let's say the worker wants more money, 10 bucks an hour. Let's be modest here. Um, and of course, capital doesn't want to pay that, so they say six. You can compromise at eight, and you don't lose anything specific. But if the pure compromise with the corrupt, the pure are corrupted. And as a consequence, politics becomes a zero-sum game. So the relationship between populism and democracy is really why we are so fascinated with this topic. Simply stated, populism is pro-democracy but anti-liberal democracy. What do I mean by that? Democracy is in essence popular sovereignty and majority rule. It means that the people elect their leaders. Liberal democracy goes further than that. It adds separation of powers. It adds minority rights. It adds rule of law. Populism is not like fascism. It believes that the people should elect its leaders. But it does not believe that minorities should be protected. Now, I'm not speaking about ethnic minorities here. I'm speaking about political minorities. And the reason is simple. In the populist mind, there is only one group that doesn't think exactly the same as the people, the elite and the elite are corrupt, and therefore they don't deserve the protections of the state. Because it is a fin-centered ideology, populism itself 
doesn't tell us much about how the state should be structured or how the economy should be structured. And this is why virtually all populist parties that are successful combine populism with what we call a host ideology. That tends to be a much thicker ideology which gives much more answers to how economies or societies should be structured. Simply stated, on the left, populism is combined with socialism, some form of it, and on the right, in most cases, populism is combined with nativism, a xenophobic form of nationalism. Now, of course, there are exceptions, and Italy is very good at exceptions, and one of the most important exceptions is the Five Star Movement. The Five Star Movement is one of the few successful populist parties that actually doesn't have a host ideology. There isn't something that is more important. But Lega is a very good example of what I call a populist radical right party. It combines populism with nativism, like Rassemblement National and many others. Today, populism is slightly more left-wing in the south and more, more right-wing in the north in both Europe and the Americas, but it is changing a bit. Um, one of the reasons why I argue that we should move a little bit away from just populism is that overall left-wing populism seems to be on a decline, not just in Europe, but in Latin America as well. Uh, the recent success in Latin America, of course, was Bolsonaro. Um, and here in the South, um, Left-wing populism is weaker too. So just a very quick overview of populism around the globe. Populism emerged in Russia and the United States at roughly the same time, but in very different movements. In the US it was called the People's Party or the Populist, which was an agrarian populist movement. They thought that the, the farmer, a very specific type of farmer, which is called a yeoman in, in the American tradition, was the real people. They had the pure values. And this agrarian populism in the US was very popular, but didn't have a good structure. It didn't have a leader, it didn't have an organization. And when the People's Party finally contested presidential election, they actually had to get a leader from the Democratic Party. It was very classic for generally right-wing populism and I would say the far right in the US. It's strong at the grassroots, but it's not very strong in terms of organization. Now, it went through various um, permutations, um, but of course, in the end, we ended up with a very un unexpected and atypical um, populist, which is Donald Trump. Now, to be honest, I didn't consider Trump a populist pretty much up until he got the nomination. I'm 100% certain that he is not a populist at heart. Donald Trump does not believe that he is just one of the people. Donald Trump is absolutely certain that he is way better than everyone else. But that is irrelevant to Donald Trump, the political phenomenon. In the primaries, he actually sold that. He sold the Donald. His argument was, we all have these problems, and only I can solve them because I am the deal maker. But the only thing in which Steve Bannon ever was relevant which is important for journalists to note as well because they keep writing about him, is that when he took over the campaign, he rephrased Donald Trump as a movement, and a movement of the people. And actually, his inaugurational speech in 2017, January, was a beauty in terms of populism. It said pretty much that he had brought the people back into the White House, thereby saying, I am one of you. Now, South America, or Latin America, is really the heartland of populism. 
throughout the 20th century, we have seen three different waves of populism. The first was Juan Perón, pretty much the 20s, 30s that this started. It was a left-wing form of populism. In the 70s, 80s, we saw a more neoliberal form of populism. And then by the turn of the century, we saw another left-wing populist uh, moment with people like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Evo Morales in Bolivia, and Rafael Correa in Ecuador. The last populist to win, though, is one of the right, more specifically the far right, which is Bolsonaro in Brazil. Europe was the other birthplace of populism in the form of the Narodniki, which was a very small group of urban intellectuals in Russia. They were agrarian populists like the Americans, but they were not grassroots. They were also very unsuccessful. They moved into the rural areas, went to the farmers, which were starving under a, a horrible feudal system, and said, you guys are the real people. You should have the power. Most farmers were not particularly impressed because they had to eat. So they didn't have time for politics. So the Narodniki got frustrated and thought, we, we try it another way. So they killed the czar, which is uh, quite a legacy, but was also the end of the Narodniki. Narodniki had some effect in the early 20th century in Central and Eastern Europe, where in Poland and Bulgaria, there were various agrarian populist uh, movements and parties. Um, and it actually had an effect on particularly Lenin, who had read some of the Narodniki and toyed with some ideas. But populism was almost dormant in much of the 20th century. There were a few explosions, like Pujadism in France, um, late 1950s. A kind of an ignored part of populism was actually PASOK in Greece, which was long the dominant party there. And more recently, we have had an explosion of populism of the left, but particularly of the right. And of course, at the moment, the man of the hour is your own, Matteo Salvini, um, who is now the personification of European populism, even though actually his uh, attempts to create one big group seem to be pretty much failing. Outside of these areas, we have had very few and uh, isolated cases of populism, although the biggest party in the world, which is the BJP in India, is a populist party, more specifically a populist radical right party. Um, some other examples are the um, economic freedom fighters in South Africa. So overall, what is important here is that populism was not a major phenomenon in most of the world in the 20th century. It had its origins in the mid-19th century. It was agrarian. After that, it was predominantly right-wing, but wasn't really successful until the end of the century, and it really took off in the early 21st century. This is an overview of the electoral scores of populist parties in Europe by decade. And I've made a difference between West and East. And as you see, the difference is actually not as big as people always think. We have this idea that populism and anything bad is primarily strong in the East and not in the West. This is not really the case, although it depends a little bit on classification. Um, this is in national elections. The Guardian helped me by publishing an article that actually shows the scores in the European elections. Um, 
by and large, the popular score is 29% in the last European election. It's an increase of about 5%, and, and that also is really fascinating because that's actually a pretty big jump. Um, but of course, we act as if it isn't. But what it also shows is that a sizable portion of it is of the far right. So why do we have populism? But more importantly, why do we have it now? That's actually something, oddly enough, that we don't have much literature on. We have a lot of literature on why the far right is successful, but that doesn't necessarily explain why left-wing populism should be successful. So let's look at the most important reason for why people vote for populist radical right parties, anti-immigration. Every, every study shows that. But why would someone who is anti-immigration vote for Podemos or Syriza, which are the most pro-immigration and pro-multicultural parties in their countries? Right, so certain things that explain the populist radical right do not necessarily explain populism per se. One of the most important explanations is that important issues are not adequately addressed by elites. Now, that sounds pretty straightforward, but it isn't. Because this is not an objective measure. Politics is not really much about objective indicators. This is about whether people feel that the elite adequately addresses issue. So they're, they're related, but they're not the same. I give you an example, two actually. Both immigration and European integration were barely discussed in the 1980s and the 1990s. Almost all major parties felt the same about it and didn't want to make it into a political issue. And so objectively, you could argue in quite a lot of countries that these were kept from the debate. I would even argue that in the Netherlands in the 1980s, it was true that you couldn't say every, anything negative about immigration. However, that sentiment was only shared by a small group of Dutch people. Today, there is a sizable portion of the Dutch population that truly believes that you can't say anything negative about Islam in the Netherlands. And yet, we haven't done anything else than say negative things about Islam since 2001 in the Netherlands. So it's not so much whether something is true, it is whether people feel that it's true. And people who vote for populist parties feel that key issues are not addressed or adequately addressed. They also feel that the elites, the different parties, are all the same. Now, this is not without reason. Particularly in the 1980s and the 1990s, almost all major parties in Western Europe were pro-immigration with all kind of limits to them, were pro-neoliberal economics, and were pro-European integration. The differences between the center-right and the center-left became significantly smaller under politicians like Tony Blair, but also David Cameron. And so quite often, we didn't have that much choice. And in Central and Eastern Europe, it was even stronger. Everyone wanted to be in the European Union, which pretty much determined everything else you could do. At the same time, there are, of course, still significant differences between political parties. And so this, be this belief 
is exactly that. And what it mostly means is that on the issue that they are busy with, they think they're the same. But take that to the issue of immigration. If you feel that immigration is the most important issue and that the border should be closed, then you only have two positions, borders closed or borders open. Whether a million come in or a thousand, that's for you the same. On a more optimistic note, and I think a very much um, kind of underplayed element, society has changed profoundly. People today are much better educated than they were decades ago. Consequently, they're also differently educated. Education has become much less authoritarian and hierarchical than it used to be. Now, I'm sure that there are a lot of students in this room who think like, well, my classes are still pretty authoritarian. True, but ask your parents, it was probably worse. Consequence of this education change is that today most people feel that, they're ter that they can judge politicians. They feel they have self-confidence on politics. I was a student in the 1980s and I did a survey once and we asked people for their, for their views. The idea was to get the first person on the phone who picked up who was adult and we would ask them. And I can't tell you how often we got a woman who was over 40 who as soon as we said, as I said, we would like to talk to you about politics, she would say, I will get my husband. The suggestion was, I don't understand politics. In the 1950s, 60s, this was not just a matter of gender, this is a matter of class as well. The majority of people did not feel competent to judge politicians. That was something that smarter people did. Today, we're all that smarter people. We all know better than everyone else. And so what we do is exactly what democratic theory wants us to do. We make political decisions independently. That is good, but that's also problematic because it means that we get volatile. We don't vote the same thing all the time. It also means we're critical. You can't just tell us anymore, well, this is the only way, because we're way smarter. We can come up with a way. If, if in the 1950s, the leader of the Catholic party says, this has to be done, the priest would also say it. And you thought, okay, well, if the priest says it, then it must be done. So. The democratization of education has led to what is called cognitive mobilization, which means that we feel that we are better informed and we feel better informed. Very importantly, the media structure is today much more favorable than it used to be. I'm not talking here about social media, which I believe is pretty much hyped in terms of its importance. The traditional media today is very differently structured than it was in the 1980s and before. In the 1980s and before, almost all media were either public, controlled by the mainstream parties, or private and linked to political parties, either through a Catholic subculture, a socialist subculture, a liberal subculture. What that meant was not necessarily that the media was bad, Although, obviously, in a socialist newspaper, you didn't read about the corruption scandals in the Socialist Party, and in the Catholic newspaper, you didn't read about the, Cath the corruption scandals in the Catholic Party. But what it meant was that mainstream parties could act as gatekeepers in the media. If you would challenge the system, then they could keep you out, and they did keep you out. They might at times write about you, but it was very rare for populists to get interviews in the 80s and 90s. In the 1990s, we saw the rise of 
private television, which was fundamental. But also we saw the privatization of a lot of media, which became more detached and more independent from the different subcultures and the different parties. They were no longer subsidized by them, which meant that they now worked on the basis of a profit model. In a profit model, you do what <coughs> Americans call chase eyeballs, which means that you try to find, you try to get people to read you, to watch you, to listen to you. Now what works? What sells? Scandal and conflict. And who provides that? Populists. Populists sell newspapers. If you want to see the evidence of that, look at the US. New York Times has never had so many subscribers as today. Washington Post through the roof. CNN has become a relevant channel again. All because of Trump. Right? And so that new structure of independence and profit motive was perfect for populists. And finally, populist actors have become more attractive. Many of the successful populists are actually pretty good at what they do. Now they do different things, but first and foremost, they try to break into the system. You have more than enough examples in this country but let's take Salvini. Matteo Salvini is constantly campaigning. I mean, it's pretty much the only thing he does, although he's a minister of interior. He has a devoted team to his social media account, which is probably bigger than the social media accounts of pretty much all the other parties combined. He's constantly on Twitter. Everything that he does is sent out and everything is targeted. Whether it's Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, many of the populists understand this medium far better. Far better than the traditional parties. I mean, just look at, for example, the number of followers of individual politicians or of parties. It is at times absolutely amazing to see parties that get 40% of the vote, or by 20% of the vote these days, that have about 60,000 followers. An average AFD politician will be much higher. But it's not only social media. Again, traditional media also wants to sell. Everyone talks about Trump as having made his success through Twitter. But that's the wrong interpretation. First of all, the only reason why people follow Trump on Twitter is because they know him from traditional TV. The Apprentice, his TV show that made him big, was on NBC, one of the mainstream networks. In the campaign, he wasn't only dominant on Twitter, First and foremost, he was always on TV. I couldn't go anywhere or I would have CNN on and Trump would be there. So it is through Twitter that populists play the traditional media. And the reason is very simple. Journalists live on Twitter. And journalists think that the, what their Twitter feed is the real world. It isn't but it's the world that is very conducive to populist. So why do we care? Which should and always be the most important reason. Like, why do we care? Are populists really important? Do they do anything that others don't do? They do. They do both positive and negative things. One of the most important things of populists that they have added to our liberal democratic systems is they have politicized or repoliticized certain issues, issues that parts of the population find important. Without the populist radical right, we would not have had the debate about immigration 
in the 1980s or 1990s. Now you can take issue with what that debate has become, but immigration and multicultural society are far too fundamental to not debate. European integration is exactly the same. Without the populist radical right, we wouldn't have debated European integration. Without the populist left, we wouldn't have debated austerity policies. We would still talk in terms of TINA. There is no alternative. And so one of the positive elements of populism is that they repoliticize politics. One of the most important problems of populism is that they polarize the political debate. Populists don't have opponents, they have enemies. You don't compromise with enemies. But polarization rarely comes from one side. And one of the things that we see in many countries where populists are powerful, particularly if they get into power, is that the opposition liberal democratic most of the time, will adopt a kind of an anti-populism, which is almost a mirror image of populism. But now the populists are the corrupt and evil people, and the liberals are the good ones. Worst example of this, Hillary Clinton's remark of the Trump supporters being deplorables. But in the wake of the Brexit referendum, I've seen it on so many Twitter accounts, how people speak about leavers, how people speak about pretty much anyone who is in favor of Brexit. And so generally, populist success leads to anti-populism, which only strengthens polarization. There's also an increase of the opportunistic use of plebiscitarian instruments, mostly referendums. Populists love referendums, but mostly in opposition. The reason is simple, of course. They think that all the other parties are the same, and they keep them out of the public debate. And so they use referendums to circumvent party politics. When they're in power, though, referendums are less important. They often do it at the beginning because they often still have, there are some vestiges of power of the old establishment. But as soon as they really have all the power, referendums don't become that useful anymore because there is only one thing really threatening to a populist. That is to lose a referendum that you organize yourself. If you say that you're the voice of the people, and the people in majority say you're not, the core of your legitimacy is undermined. And so referendums become risky. We see a weakening of non-majoritarian institutions, courts, and media. Italy went through this under Berlusconi. He wasn't very good at this. And as a consequence, structurally, he didn't change much. But the same as in the US at the moment. Trump is endlessly attacking courts and media, isn't fundamentally changing things. But there is more to that. What you do see is self-censorship. The way that traditional media write about Trump is much more cautious. They will, for example, hardly ever say that he lied. Right? They will have all kind of euphemisms about it. And so those attacks don't have to be institutional. Just attacking independent courts, independent businesses, independent media can lead to self-censorship which is also useful. But when it really goes bad, populism can change a liberal democracy into an illiberal democracy, which is a system where still the majority votes and determines its leaders, but you no longer have separation of powers. 
you no longer have a rule of law and you no longer have the protection of minorities. My friend Viktor Orban is pretty much the most skillful populist and populist radical right leader in Europe. Unlike Berlusconi, he came to power fully and with a plan. Hungary today is not even an illiberal democracy anymore. It is now a competitive authoritarian regime. The opposition is allowed to exist, but cannot actually win elections. So let me conclude. Populism has, long, has a long, but a relatively marginal history around the world until the late 20th century, with the exception of Latin America, and more specifically, a few countries within Latin America. Populism is peaking in the early 21st century, but its popularity is still overstated. Think about the last European elections. We are now actually celebrating that the non-populist forces have won. It's a ridiculous thing to say. The populists were never going to win. I haven't seen any polls that predicted that populists would get the majority of the vote. But we have talked ourselves into such a frenzy that we by and large implicitly talk about the people as the voters of the populist. We think that the populists are the real voice of the people. And consequently, mainstream parties will do anything to appear as pandering to the real people, or in other words, the voter of the populist. Populism can be both a corrective and a threat for liberal democracy. It's mostly a corrective in opposition. And the key correction is repolitization of the debate. It will bring important issues on the agenda and force other parties to deal with it. Sadly, when in power, populism will almost always lead to a weakening of liberal democracy both in its values and in its institutions. I think the best way to think about populism is as an illiberal democratic response to undemocratic liberalism. Now, obviously, that's a nice play of words, which was constructed to get more citations, but there's actually an idea behind it. I think I have explained why populism is illiberal democratic. It supports majority rule, but it undermines uh, minority protections. But it responds to decades of liberalism that actually was in spirit rather than in procedure undemocratic. The European Union is a good example. The European Union was forced into becoming a more democratic space. But up until the mid 1990s, almost no issue of relevance to the European Union was discussed in the political debate. It was never part of national elections. It wasn't part of European elections. And actually, the last European elections over the weekend are no exception. There was not any debate in any of the various 28 member states that was a clear campaign about the European elections with different visions of Europe at stake. And yet, in the next legislature, there will be various new policies with very big consequences that are going to be pushed through. And so, it is this idea that neoliberalism and European integration have been pushed through by technocrats and democrats that the populists respond to. And they say, there is no alternative is wrong. If we don't want it, we don't have to do it. If the EU says that you need to do it, we get out of the EU. None of these things are set in stone. It's all up to the people. 
finally, populism is increasingly far right. As I wrote in The Guardian, populism is dead, long live the far right. The point that I want to make here is, we started to talk about populism roughly around the Great Recession, because what we saw was that this kind of protest, which up until then was mostly on the radical right, now also found its form on the left. Syriza, Podemos, France Insoumise. If you look at the last election, left-wing populism is over. Podemos is barely populist and barely popular. Syriza has become pretty much like the best pupil in the class of the EU, doing everything that the EU wants, even though it sparsely still uses some populism domestically. Mélenchon is completely marginal. When we talk about the rise of populism today, we talk about Bolsonaro, we talk about Trump, we talk about Brexit, we talk about Salvini, we talk about Orban. All of them are populist, but not only populist. They're populist, they're nativist, they're authoritarian. And actually, it is the nativism that is at the core of their ideal, ideological project. And the populism is secondary to that. Thank you very much. Grazie mille, Cass, eh, ci hai, dato una, eh, hai cercato di spiegarci un pochino che cosa, che cosa sta succedendo, è eh, molto interessante. Eh, io ero negli Stati Uniti quando è stato eletto Barack Obama e, e anche ho visto le due inaugurazioni. Le inaugurazioni di Barack Obama c'erano milioni di persone eh, e a quella di Trump ce n'erano molto meno, poi lui si è anche arrabbiato come sappiamo. Però quando hai ricordato che lui durante la sua inaugurazione ha detto in questo momento la gente torna alla Casa Bianca, soltanto l'idea che quelle poche centinaia di migliaia di persone che erano lì potessero rappresentare tutto il popolo era ovviamente in contraddizione enorme con quello che era successo otto anni prima. E quindi questa narrativa che impongono è vincente ed è anche il motivo per cui siamo qui a cercare di capire come fanno a vincere su queste cose che ehm, sembra quasi che si stanno tutti, ci mettiamo in questo frenzy come dici tu, ci stiamo forse un po' autonudendo, però siamo qui, siamo con i risultati di questo voto europeo. Una cosa che ti voglio chiedere al volo è un, un, um, un aggettivo che usiamo moltissimo in Italia, è sovranismo, sovranisti, Salvini stesso lo sta usando e volevo sapere se per te lo usi insieme a populisti, nativisti e autoritari, per te è un po' la stessa cosa o vedi qualche differenza? E per il resto, ehm, se ci sono delle domande, c'è un microfono, i microfoni che sono in, in sala e vi prego di essere brevi con le vostre domande. Se intanto vuoi magari rispondere su questa cosa del sovranismo, intanto vi preparate. Oppure, ecco, guarda, ce n'è una qui. Yeah, um, I guess this one is on too. Let me just say something though uh, about Barack Obama too. Um, Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily the biggest fan, but um, what is important and totally forgotten is that actually uh, Barack Obama also got a lot of protest vote. I mean, what made Barack Obama so attractive to many people was that he was an unknown, that he actually had only been a senator for two years. Um, and so many saw him also as an outsider. Um, But what is also really interesting, and that shows like, that politics is about creation. It's not about facts. It's about interpretations of facts. We now have a movement where the son of a billionaire is the voice of the people, and a son of pretty low middle class people of mixed racial heritage is seen as the elite. Like Barack Obama, who grew up in relatively modest circumstances, is seen as the elite. Like Donald Trump, who only made money because his father gave him massive amounts of money, and there's even some calculation that said if he had just invested it, 
he would be richer today than what he did with it, is seen as the people. And so this shows you like what politics is about. It's about reinterpretations of reality. I'm not a big fan of sovereignist and sovereignist and whatever it is, in part because I come from a Germanic language and it's not very easy to translate it. But I also think that it's actually a political ploy and obviously I'm, I'm very Gramsci in here, but in the end, politics is about redefining uh, words, it's about redefining struggles. This is not just about being a sovereign nation. You can be a sovereign nation with a lot of immigrants. Right? This is about a nativist state. And in a nativist state, you're sovereign and you're homogenous. Right? And so I think the sovereignist is, is a, a, a way to come up with a less negative term for what is essentially like just a, a nativist movement. So yes, it is part of it, and it's of course, it's, let's say it's their, it's their pleasant face. Like it's say, taking our country back. Like, but whom are you taking it back from, and why are you taking it back? Sovereignism doesn't say much about it. Nativism does. Indeed. Quindi forse dovremmo anche stare attenti eh, o i media o gli altri a usare il termine sovranista? I think the media should always be careful and much more careful than they are um, with all terms, but also academics, I mean, and, and just people. I mean, this is like why I say I don't think they should use populism if they only speak about the populist radical right. Like, first of all, leaving aside even the political struggle, which clearly I'm part of, it's also not particularly accurate. Like, um, we, we, re we regularly read like, um, an anti-immigration proposal as a populist proposal, but populism as the pure people versus the corrupt elite says nothing about immigration. Nativism does. Right? And so it is the populist radical right that is anti-immigrant, not populist. Yes, <coughs> the question will be in English. No? Um, yes, you said that uh, populism was a useful corrective as long as it's uh, not too big, but it's a big threat once it's in power. So obviously one should try to have uh, strategies to prevent it from uh, going to power. I'm uh, Belgium, and uh, so last uh, Sunday we had a big uh, upsurge of the radical right uh, party, despite something that's called in Belgium the cordon sanitaire, which means uh, no coalition uh, with uh, the far right, and uh, also to some extent a uh, mediatic uh, a boycott by the media. So is this strategy that consists in trying to uh, tell, to mute the radical right, to tell them to shut up and to prevent them from entering any coalition, uh, still effective today, given in particular the role of the social media and the fact that the radical right party, for example, in Belgium, had spent more on social media than all the other parties together, meaning, of course, that most of their supporters get most of their information in that way and no longer through the traditional media or through exposure as a result of participation in power. Wolfgang Merkel, Berlin. Uh, congratulations to your talk, and I can agree to most of the points and arguments you brought forward. But I do think one of your sentences needs some more elaboration. And this is the sentence, anti-populism only creates populism. If this is true, and if it is also true that the established political parties left a representational gap, and if we do not want to leave it all to the civil society to react, what is left as a political reaction? Thank you very much. Intanto, if you want to take these two questions, fatemi un cenno se avete delle domande. Yeah, they're, they're, they're connected at a certain um, <clears throat> level, but let me just first speak to, um, to the Belgian 
case, which is a, which is a very interesting case because uh, Belgium was actually the country with probably um, the first success for um, the modern populist I and mean, the Vlaams bloc at that point in time was the first to enter uh, a national parliament in 1978 as, a, as part of a list. Um, it had its, what they call in Belgium, Black Sunday in 1991, where it had its breakthrough. And as a consequence of its earlier breakthrough, it had this cordon sanitaire, which according to the founder of it, a green politician called Jos Gijsels, um, was only meant to prevent coalitions um, with the far right, but was always broader. It included uh, a cordon in the media. Um, Vlaams Belang didn't get a voice in there. They wrote about them, but they didn't interview them. It also, by and large, meant not speaking about what was seen as their issues, most notably immigration, but also crime. Now, along the way, the cordon sanitaire was remarkably successful um, in the sense that Vlaams Belang, in the end, lost. Uh, 2008, it started, and 2014 was the big uh, defeat. This was to a large extent because Cordon. A lot of people had voted for Vlaams Belang over and over again, and all the time saw them being ostracized, and they thought, let's look for someone else. That someone else was actually someone who was not that relevant, uh, Jean-Marie de Decker, and then the NVA took over. During that period, when the Vlaams Belang was very small, the media cordon was already abolished. And so over the last couple of years, Vlaams Belang uh, politicians have been interviewed and even had op-eds in Flemish newspapers. But more importantly, particularly since 2015, the NVA, let's say the Flemish Nationalist Party, although it's more a conservative party, really, um, really made immigration and security its key issue. And it was a perverse strategy because it actually worked and didn't work. I mean, the argument was we have to do this, otherwise people vote for the Vlaams Belang. But what actually happened was that the people who thought that the NVA, which had raised expectations, didn't meet them, went to the populist radical right Vlaams Belang. At the same time, the NVA picked up a lot of votes from the moderate right, Christian Democrats and liberals, who thought, okay, if immigration and security is the key issue, we should vote for someone who is tough on that, but we don't want to go to the radical right. And so it led to a massive shift to the right overall. Um, Social media played a bit of a role, but I think we give far too little credit to Tom van Grieke, the new president of the party, and his team. I mean, this Vlaams Belang is a very different party and falls completely in line with Lega and, and, and with other successful parties that are parties that are actually pretty active. They target very well. Yes, they spent more money on social media, but overall they didn't spend more money than others. They just spend it better to a large extent. Um, I did, Wolfgang, technically, well, technically, I think literally I didn't say anti-populism creates populism in the sense that anti-populism almost always follows success of populism. I think it strengthens polarization. Um, how, so how do you respond? I mean, it's not that you can't say that populism is a problem, but you, can't, you shouldn't say it in the sense that populists and populist voters are bad people, are corrupt people with whom you can't compromise. Um, but more importantly, I don't believe that the strategy, that the struggle should, the struggle should not be against populism. The struggle should be for liberal democracy. Populism is a symptom of a broader problem. Even if we defeat populism, and the easiest way is just to ban them, what do you win? You have a liberal democratic system that isn't challenged, but is still not supported by a significant part of the people. If you win people over for liberal democracy, and I'm talking here about a system, 
Liberal democracy is a system in which we have Christian democracy, social democracy, Greens, liberals, like all of them. If we win people back or new people over for our ideas, which fall within liberal democracy, by definition, populism is weaker. And so that's one part. The second part is if we fight populism, we play their game. They set the agenda, they determine the issues. And most of the time, they're better at it because that is what they are about. We see it now in the US with Trump. If you make it into a conflict with him, his supporters love that. Many of the Democrats don't. They don't come out to vote to punish Trump. They come out to vote to get health care, to get better education, and to get a better economic system. So to me, it is about a positive agenda in which populism is almost a side note. Grazie mille. Io su questa nota una, una precisazione, se vuoi. Quando, al, eh, parlando di questo, hai parlato di immigrazione e di società multiculturale come due fattori veramente molto importanti che devono essere discussi nella società. In questo momento due, eh, questi due issues sono stati praticamente presi in ostaggio quasi dai populisti nativisti, come dir si voglia, e come dicevi tu, invece, la lotta dovrebbe essere per la, libera per la democrazia liberale, non contro i populisti. Tu che conosci bene l'Europa e che sei stato nelle ultime tre settimane in Europa, hai visto qualche caso in alcuni paesi dove la discussione è stata riuscita a essere tirata via dalle tenaglie ideologiche, se vuoi, dei populisti e riportata su un piano di sono problemi che dobbiamo discutere insieme e cerchiamo di trovare una soluzione. Perché mi sembra che ad esempio in Italia in questo momento e in altri paesi la discussione sull'immigrazione sia stata completamente presa in ostaggio e si, e si faccia molta fatica ad eh, discuterla come dovrebbe essere fatta. Se hai qualche esempio anche per, per noi. È um, un bit difficile. I mean, you could say that Spain is doing pretty well. Um, the, the Spanish Social Democrats not only took the responsibility to govern, they did it on the basis of their own platform, um, and they were rewarded for it. Um, they have even stood up for refugees that a certain country that shall not be named didn't want to take up. Um, at the same time, immigration has never been a major issue in Spanish politics, and so it's, it's difficult to compare. Um, well, they, they have pretty high numbers, but um, I mean, they're, so the United States, um, which I only defend when I'm not in the United States, it seems, um, actually has a remarkably uh, pro-diversity uh, debate. If you look at the Democratic Party, including Hillary Clinton when she ran, like, she had an amazingly positive and inclusive message towards both non, like, let's say, minorities, non-whites, and immigrants. Um, without pandering to, um, really, to nativists, she only started to do that after she lost, sadly. Um, we don't see that. Like, we just don't see that. Macron seemed to be that, but has since walked it back with all kind of remarks and policies towards Muslims in particular. Um, again, I, I, so there is, of course, a positive debate. Like, there is a positive option. Many of the green parties are supportive of multiculturalism, although much less than they used to be, um, and, and somewhat immigration. But I mean, green parties have a relatively limited um, um, audience. Uh, within social democracy, you don't see much. Um, within center-right, you see virtually nothing. Um, and the liberals are kind of, I'm pretty silent about it. But I think it should always be part of a broader agenda. Like, you should talk about immigration and multiculturalism, but only if you also talk about education, about health care, about welfare, about pensions. And importantly,
and that's also to the media, you should also talk to the populist radical right about those issues. One of the things that we see is that the populist radical right are only asked about immigration and security. Remember the debate between Macron and Marine Le Pen. Marine Le Pen was a very capable politician who got totally mixed up on our Euro policy. And according to all polls, failed and paid a price for that. We have many examples of that, of populist radical right politicians who are, who are uh, kind of pushed outside of their comfort zone with very important issues because every study shows that education and welfare, unemployment are high concerns of many people. If we interview those politicians on those issues, many are bad and others are just mediocre, right? And so if we bring the debate back to all the issues, I think the radical right will already like, be, more, be more limited. Grazie mille, se non ci sono altre domande io ringrazio Cass per questo suo straordinario contributo. Grazie, grazie a tutti di essere venuti.